Oh, usually, it's usually not this. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I see. <laughs> My pleasure today to introduce Professor Alex Vakakis, and I thought I would tell you some things about him. Uh, he, I asked him before what things I should say, and he says, be sure to say that you knew me uh, in 1989 when he was a PhD student at Caltech, and I was taking a sabbatic at uh, UCLA. And uh, he graduated uh, from Caltech and became a professor at UIUC. And uh, he uh, is in, he's a chair professor, actually, in the mechanical engineering department. And uh, between uh, his current position at UIUC and his former position, he went back to Greece and was a professor at the University of uh, Athens. National, what is it? National? National Technical University of Athens. National Technical University of Athens for uh, what? Something like seven, eight, eight years. years. Eight yeah. Years. And um, his research area is dynamics and controls. He has uh, about 200 papers on those subjects, and he has written books on uh, nonlinear normal modes and uh, nonlinear target energy transfer. He's writing a book now on dynamics and acoustics of uh, order granule material, media, I should say. And uh, I was looking at his reprints and listed on his website, and uh, I was very pleased. That over the years, I, I've written five papers with him. And uh, he's going to tell us today about something that is completely new. I've never heard of it before. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, having so many friends, and of course, this is a historic place, and historic department, uh, you know, uh, in dynamics, the area of dynamics, so it's always a great pleasure when I visit. So, yeah, just uh, just going directly to, uh, to the talk. So, I want to talk about, uh, about some of our recent uh, work in the area of uh, what we call nonlinear sonic biker, and uh, what, 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 what are these media? Um, these are, you can consider them as highly degenerate um, uh, dynamical systems that, uh, the main characteristic is that have uh, no linear acoustics. So basically, you, they're devoid of any linear uh, properties, and so uh, the acoustics are essentially nonlinear, a strong nonlinear. So you cannot use methods from, uh, from classical acoustics uh, to, to study their behavior. And I want to give two examples. I mean, I'm, again, I'm very ambitious in my talk, so, so normally I'm running out of time, but so I try to do the best I can. So, so, so I, will call, I will focus on two areas, on, on two such systems, just to give a flavor of what we're doing. Um, here's the first system that I'm going to discuss. It's, uh, it's a chain of uh, N uh, particles moving in the plane, and these are connected by linear springs. Uh, everything's linear, okay? Everything's linear. Uh, but each particle can move in the uh, axial or in the vertical direction, right? So it's free to move. And we're not making any assumption whatsoever regarding the uh, displacements of these particles. And we'll stage forward to write the equation of motion. These are given by this. Right? Now, there are many different ways that you can proceed from here. Uh, how are you going to do your asymptotics? Actually, when we submitted a recent paper, one of the reviewers said, aha, you caught them. Uh, then they use long asymptotics. And he provided his or her, we don't know, uh, on asymptotics, which is correct, right? The reviewers' asymptotics are correct. But our asymptotics are correct, too. So, so, <laughs> so, so we're assuming, we're assuming there's no uh, stretch on the relaxed. Yeah, 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 absolutely right. So at the equilibrium position, there's no stretch on the swings. So, yeah, there's no pretension on anything like that. So we'll try to convince the reviewer that you know, we're right, too. So we'll see what happens. Uh, okay, so the equation of motion I've uh, given by this. And then uh, Ti is the tension in the ith swing, okay? And uh, lambda i prime minus lambda i is the stretching of the ith swing, and you can uh, write uh, the exact formula for the stretching of the ith swing. And so you can express the uh, angles, uh, the phi i angle and the phi i plus one angle, the, the angles from the uh, horizontal uh, position of uh, mass i, uh, you know, of this point here uh, and, and this point here uh, by, by these complicated formulas. So, so the, the, the system is strong linear. 
right? It's very obvious. And actually, it's, uh, and what, what causes this geometric linearity, basically. So the geometry and the kinematics of the motion itself cause this strong linearity. Even though the system is, is perfectly linear. Okay, how do we proceed from here? Okay, so now we have to make some important assumptions. First, let's assume that we are in the limit of small energy oscillations. So what I'm going to show you here is for this system at the low energy limit. Now typically, you expect to get strong linear phenomena, right, in the high energy limit, right? Uh, here's, uh, au contraire, on this system, the interesting phenomena that we want to discuss, including the sonic volume, occur in the small energy uh, limit. We assume small energy oscillations, small angles, and so we can expand the geometric linear terms in Taylor series in terms of these differences, uh, ui minus one, the i minus one, and we can express the uh, uh, tension in the ice ring uh, by, by, by this, and the i epsilon i is, is, is this expression, and we expand it, we retain only the linear the terms which are linear in u and quadratic in, in v. u are the axial deformations, v are the transverse deformation, we can express the angles, uh, cosine phi i as such, sine phi i as such. Then, finally, this is the critical assumption here. That's what the reviewer did not like, actually. So, but it's correct. Uh, <coughs> so, we assume, we took this small power of the epsilon, and here is the first time we introduce epsilon. And so, epsilon denotes the smallness of the vertical deformations. Okay? And we make the assumptions. The assumption actually that <coughs> the axial deformations are even smaller, are over epsilon squared. So we're in the low energy limits, and we make the assumption that ui is an order of magnitude smaller than vi. And then we introduce the new time, the normalized time tau, by using this epsilon as well. So that's it. We plug everything in. But you can't do axial, you can't do this, the axial vibration. Term. You can what? Then you've killed the no. pure linear. No, no, we did not kill it yet. We will. <laughs> but, we, but, but not yet. Uh, throughout the analysis, we will keep the actual uh, deformations. Yeah, uh, we'll keep the vertical and the actual deformations. However, the actual deformations will be driven by the vertical ones. Okay? Do you want to comment on this quantity L without the subscript? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, so L is the distance between particles at the. Um, so yeah. So basically, L is the common is the common difference between the, the particles of the chain, uh -huh. and we normalize it to one over n, so that the total distance is one. Uh -huh. So it's just a, a scale factor. Uh -huh. Okay. So L is the common distance. Okay. If you do that, then you can show that the axial deformations are governed by this equation here. And this is what you would expect in the linear chain, right? In the Fibonacci chain. So that, that's the classical linear chain, with the exception that now you have an epsilon squared uh, multiplying the second derivative. So this becomes singular. Uh, and then this is, this is perturbed by, by this term here, the quadratic terms. And of course, you have to impose the boundary conditions. This will turn out to be very important. The boundary conditions of this problem hold the key to the sonic vacuum. Without them, you cannot realize the sonic vacuum. Or if you rescale, uh, if you uh, use rescaled axial tensions, you can bring these equations here into this form, where Ti over bar is the scaled uh, 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 tension in the ice ring and ti over bar i plus one uh, in the spring i plus one. So far, so good for the axial deformations. What about the vertical ones? Okay, so the vertical ones are given by these expressions where there's no epsilon. There's no epsilon. The only epsilon comes here. And actually, this will allow us to separate the dynamics uh, the slow from the fast dynamics, right? So that's the key to achieving the sonic bike. Okay, so this, uh, the fact that the axial deformation are in the form, uh, the axial deformation in the form of a singular perturbed system of equations will allow us to partition the dynamics. So, 
So the leading order approximation, if you want the outer solution, right? So the leading order slow approximation, uh, you set epsilon equal zero. So for epsilon equal zero in that limit, then you get that the tension is constant because then this epsilon square term goes to zero. Again, we don't stop the analysis there. That's just the leading order. And then you can compute the uniform tension using this expression here. So the uniform <coughs> tension is expressed in terms of the vertical displacements. And of course, it depends on the number of particles. Okay, so at the leading order, the tension is constant in space, but varies in time. Uh, but when higher orders uh, are taken into account, as we will see, this tension varies slowly in space. Then you plug this, this expression into the equation for the uh, for the transverse oscillations, and you get this expression. And what you realize is that what you're staring at is at the sonic fiber. Uh, that means that uh, this system has no linear acoustics. Okay. Why? Because you have you know the classical term here, linear term, but this is multiplied by this, is multiplied by this term here, which does not depend on I. Mm -hmm. Not only that, not only that, but what is even more intriguing is that, this to us, is that um, although the original system had only local interactions, this is strongly local, you see? So basically, each, each oscillator depends on all oscillators which is very interesting. And of course, the physical reason is that because it's the internal tension that couples all these oscillators. And this depends on the crystal stream. So that's the sonic vacuum. And so we started from a simple system, low energy, and by doing the asymptotics as we did here, in the leading order, uh, slow approximation, uh, we get uh, this, uh, this expression. The surprises do not end here. So here's the uh, here's the uh, um, the expression uh, for uh, these equations, and where I use tau tau. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the tension that, that varies in time, but not in space, uh, and is expressed in terms of the transverse displacement. Uh, and uh, where would we see strong nonlinear? Uh, and, and and then what 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 what's the plan? If we are able to compute the solution of the V equation, right, we compute the solid Viking solution, then we go back to the axial equations. Up to now, we said this guy equals to zero, right? And then we plug this into here, and so this becomes a non-homogeneous system of linear equations, which then I can solve. That will introduce fast components into the dynamic. But you need the fast components, why? To satisfy the boundary conditions, right? So if you do not, if you do not introduce the fast components we come, we, we, which will come from the homogeneous solution of this guy, once we have computed the V, you cannot satisfy this case, okay? So that's the plan, right? Yeah. Something got lost, which is the, the big linear vibrations in the axial direction. And you squash them by assuming that the displacements in the axial direction are small somehow. Yeah. That's so the limit. If you had any of those, oh, it would be the whole thing, right? Absolutely. That's what the reviewer said, actually. <laughs> so, so you're absolutely right. Was you are right. No, no. I mean. <laughs> that, but you're absolutely right. I mean, but that's a different limit. That's a different limit, right? Well, it's a different solution. So it's like a set of solutions that you're saying. Absolutely. You're throwing those away. Well, I'm using a different asymptotics. That's what I'm saying that for this asymptotics, we need to get rid of that, of that uh, class of solutions, you're right. Later, I will show you some simulations of the exact system, and we'll see that, indeed, uh, the, you know, this holds. I'm wondering if it's a different class of asymptotics or if it's more like what Andy says, that there's an invariant subspace where the motions that Andy is considering are absent. But it's invariant, which is what you're saying. If you live in this invariant subspace, 
without those axial motions. Might be, who knows? No, we don't, we don't know, we just think about it. <laughs> yeah, I, think exactly. I think that's what you're Might saying. That you're, you're studying the dynamics I, on this certain invariant subspace where the reviewer's motions are not present. I view it, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's a possibility, it's a possibility. But how I view it is that, you know, if you do not assume that the axial vibrations are small, then the vertical will be driven by the, uh, the axial. Whereas here, the, the axial are driven by the vertical. Okay? So it sounds like what Steve said. Yeah. He was like, if you kill those, there's this other whole space. But again, we're not exactly killing them. Uh, we just, we, we allow them to exist, but uh, uh, at, uh, at, 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 at fast oscillations. So we, we do not, so, so if we don't do that, we cannot separate the slow and fast components. So again, it's a matter of how you formulate the problem. But this solution, I assure you, this exists because numerically they have been proven to exist. It's just the limits. I understand is a is a non conventional way to to find this. Yes, to, to, to take this limit. No, but if, if you just start with a full nonlinear equation, a full exact simulator, you'll only see these solutions if you start out with axial displacements which are much smaller than the vertical. In displacement. the small limit, yes, exactly. So it's In a the small limit. Space that In space. the small energy limits, yes, true, yes, right, absolutely true. Yes, all right. Okay. So, so this uh, quantity T plays the role of an effective time varying speed of sound. So, uh, although you do not have a speed of sound as defined, a constant speed of sound as defined in classical acoustics, it plays the role of an effective uh, uh, speed of sound, which is fully tunable with energy, right? So, now, the Stoner locality, which is interesting, it's quite interesting to us. Is, is directly caused by the fixed expansion conditions, okay, which give rise to this uh, nearly uniform axial tension and the geometric nonlinearity, of course. Now, if you change the boundary conditions to free free or free fixed, then you lose the sonic vacuum, right? You cannot achieve that. But, uh, and then you get the weak nonlinear acoustics, and then, you know, it could be, uh, uh, you know, solutions like the ones that you mentioned can be realized. Uh, but also, if you consider boundary conditions with springs, for example, okay? And you can tune the springs. You can still recover the sonic vacuum. Okay. Can you explain this word sonic vacuum? The, uh, yeah, yeah, I will do that here. I will do that here, yes. So why we call it sonic vacuum? We have a positive continuum limit. So if you assume that L, that quantity, uh, goes to zero by, increasing, by fixing the total fixing the total uh, length of the chain to one and let n go to infinity, the number of particles of infinity, then you can do a very standard uh, long wave approximation and get this equation here, which is like, you see, this is like the equation you get in the beam theory, right? Where you have the nonlinear stretching term. But this appears now at the second order. So, so, so we call it sonic vacuum because, you know, in the classical wave equation, that would be a constant, right? Whereas here, uh, this, this bracket here plays the role of the uh, speed of sound, the effective speed of sound, if you want to. And, 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 and this depends on the, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the solution itself. But the word sonic vacuum means zero speed of sound? Well, that's a good question. Uh, it depends how one defines the speed of sound. So if you, defi if you define the speed of sound as, as, uh, you know, as in linear acoustics, clearly there's no linear term here. So in that case, it's a sonic vacuum. In, in that sense, yes. Now, this doesn't mean that you do not have disturbance propagation here. You do have traveling waves, okay? But not in the traditional, I mean, the speed, of, the effective speed of sound that you define is not like you do in classical acoustics. But the, the word sonic vacuum, is that, is that defined outside of this talk, or did you invent it? Oh, no, 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 I did not invent that. Pardon me. It means? Uh, this means the zero speed of sound is defined in classical acoustics. So, in the second application with Granville Media, actually Nesterenko, Vitaly Nesterenko was the first to coin the term sonic vacuum, and he did it for Granville Media, and I'm gonna come back to that. So we borrowed that from here. So. But if I think of this as in the continuum limit, you'd have an extreme or something like that. There's no tension at all until you start to displace it, so there's no, no restoring force, so there's no speed of sound. Right, right, exactly. There's no internal tension, yes, exactly. Okay, so, so then uh, let me say a, a few words about a resonance interaction. I mean, uh, the, the other surprising <coughs> thing, which mathematically is not very surprising, you can, you can uh, uh, prove it fairly easy, 
uh, uh, is, is that uh, this system is exactly and standing waves, normal modes, and non normal modes, right? And these are exactly the non normal modes, the standing waves that you would encounter in the chain, uh, in the linear chain. So, so they satisfy the same orthogonality conditions. It's, it's very surprising, but uh, this is a system that, although strongly nonlinear, is nonlinearizable, yet it has n, if you have n particles, it has exactly n standing waves, and these are orthogonal to each other. Right? It's highly, uh, highly unexpected. You know, it's, 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 exact, it's an exact result. Uh, now, they don't superpose. Not all, of course not. And, and not all of them are stable. Not all of them are stable, right? Uh, half of them are stable, actually. The other half of them are unstable. But, but you know, of course you cannot superimpose. But, but if, you, if you say that, if you restrict the motion in a manifold on, the, on a, you know, of a single mode, then you get a model lamp like this, right? And, and, and the frequency is the linearized frequency, well, the frequency of the chain, or the corresponding chain, times the amplitude, uh, uh, well, it, it's, uh, Basically, it, it is, you know, the solution term is, can be written in terms of an elliptic function, so you can get an uh, a frequency in terms of a complete elliptic integral, and that will depend on energy. Now, let's, let's um, just as an aside, let's try to study one to one internal resonances between any two arbitrary modes. Well, let's take the kth mode and the pth mode. So these are the kth standing wave and the p standing wave, and these are differentiated by the wave number, right? The, uh, uh, okay. And so uh, let's let's write this in that. In other words, let's restrict the dynamics on a resonance manifold uh, composed of the kth and the pth nonlinear modes in terms resonance. Then you express the response in this way. Then you plug this into the equation, and the fact that these modes are orthogonal allow you to completely determine the equation governing the amplitude. So that's that's something different compared to other methods. Well, classical only at the dynamical systems where you cannot do that because the modes do not satisfy orthogonality conditions. Here you do. And so these are the exact equations. These are the exact equations for the two modes, right? the, kth, the kth mode and the pth mode. Um, and let's assume that only these two modes uh, are engaged in two resonance. And then we can introduce another transformation here and bring it into, into simpler form. All right. Now, to impose the condition of one, uh, of one resonance, uh, clearly the instantaneous frequencies of the two modes, the frequency of oscillation of ones, will depend on energy. So let's assume that the corresponding, well, the natural frequencies of the corresponding P and K modes of the linear chain are close. So let's introduce um, a, a parameter epsilon one, which is much smaller than one, to denote that, you know, that P and K are close in frequency, right? And let's assume that the amplitudes of these guys are of the same order. Then, <coughs> then uh, we have, you know, this, this we, we use this, what we call complexification averaging uh, uh, method, and this was invented by, by Colabo, a little of ours, uh, Leonid Manevich, as the Institute of Chemical Physics, right, in Moscow. And basically, uh, it, it allows for an ad hoc slow fast decomposition of dynamics. Is that a formal method? But 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 I, I think it works, right? So 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 so, so let's introduce the, the complex variable psi one of tau, and uh, the real part is the velocity of the kth mode, and uh, the amplitude of the kth mode. Well, the derivative of the amplitude of the kth mode, capital omega, is the common frequency the common frequency of oscillation. And AK is the amplitude of the kth mode. And now let's express this in terms of a slow, of a slow complex amplitude multiplied by a fast amplitude, right? In essence, you, you do a slow fast decomposition of dynamics. It's the slow component, the fast component. And do the same thing for the second mode. So P1 would correspond to kth mode, P2 to the uh, pth mode. If you do that, and you substitute back into the mode of the equations, and you do averaging with respect to capital omega, you get this modulation equation, which are not exact. These are not exact, because you throw out the higher frequencies, right? The higher frequency components. But 
if you want, this is the slow flow. This is the slow flow of one-to-one -one resonance interaction between the two modes. And again, we kept K and P uh, arbitrary at this point. Only we want them to be uh, close. Uh, the, in, in the spectrum, we want them to be close. You see that we have chubby nonlinearities here, definitely. And uh, so this, uh, how, do we, how do we study this, this system here? Again, this is the slow flow. Well, uh, it's a standard procedure. You use polar coordinates, which is VI as AI, up, real amplitudes in phase, and then you express AI, given that the energy is conserved, you have no damping, no dissipation. So in a, actually what you do is you reduce to an isoenergetic torus, right? So, so basically if R denotes the, uh, the energy, and theta is an angle, so if it's an angle in delta, is the phase difference, uh, beta to minus beta one, you can show that you can reduce the dynamics on this adjoining torus. The energy is conserved, okay? During this resonance interaction, the energy is conserved, and so basically these are the two angles of the torus. And uh, so what are the dynamics of the torus? And here is where, where, where things get really interesting. Um, uh, so, so, Okay, um, so let's take some example uh, uh, for a particular application. Uh, the, the, the case when K is n minus one and P is n. So we take the highest mode and the next from the highest mode, right? These two modes. And in this case, epsilon one is the perturbation parameter, will be a function of n. You can compute the, uh, the difference you get in terms of the frequencies of the uh, linear system, you get this, which, as we increase the number of particles, it tends to, uh, it, it tends to, uh, uh, it's, it's much less than one, it to zero. So in the degenerate limit, when you have an infinite number of particles, well, you get, you lose the sonic vacuum, basically. So you get a degenerate linear system, uh, because uh, then uh, the, 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 the tension uh, uh, would be severe, the boundary condition would be held to infinity, and then you get this picture. And what is this? This is a traveling wave. Okay, this, this fixed point here, which is a stable fixed point, is a traveling wave, and uh, for an infinite chain, you have the classical uh, traveling wave. And then this, this bolded line here is a degenerate, what we call LPT. Is uh, Again, this is a a concept developed by Leonid Manevich is a limited phase trajectory is called. So if you want a limited phase trajectory is the anti is, is the anti limit of a standing vibration. So standing vibration you have um, localization of energy in a, in a certain mode, right? And this mode vibrates in a standing wave. In LPT you have the maximum possible exchange between modes. You can view it like this. So so if you want to study energy exchange between modes then the LPTs are the mathematical tool you want to use. If the number of particles is, 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 is big, but, but not infinite, right? Then epsilon is small. And so this picture here, this is the generous picture, uh, picture here, uh, becomes this picture. Now, the travel, so we're talking here about a finite system, right? A finite system. And the traveling wave here becomes what I would call a pseudo traveling wave. <coughs> okay, a pseudo traveling wave. And I will explain what this is. It has the characteristics of both uh, a traveling wave, but also a standing wave. Uh, it's crazy, I know, but, but you know, you, you see what I mean. And, and the, the generate LPT <coughs> becomes this, this continuous orbit. And this, this orbit here corresponds to uh, the maximum <laughs> amount of energy exchange of beaten, if you want, of beat phenomenon between the two modes. So in this bolded line here, there's a lot of energy exchange. There's highly intense energy exchange between the modes. Uh, just to show you what I mean, this is what I call the pseudo traveling wave, right? So this is for a, a chain, a sonic vacuum, with 200 particles. And uh, what I'm plotting here is uh, uh, the displacement of uh, the deformation, the vertical deformations of the particles versus time, starting from particle one. And then, you know, I, I just displace the, I, sh I show particle 100, particle 200, and in between particles, and I just displace this curve so that for the, for, for, 
for clarity, right? And you, you see that definitely there's something that appears like a traveling wave, right? It's like something like this is a travel wave, except close to the boundaries, where the traveling wave basically becomes like a standing wave. Right? Why does this happen? Well, this is a this is a perturbation of this degenerate traveling wave, but now you have boundary conditions. So the system, <laughs> the wave tries to propagate, but it still has to satisfy the boundary condition, right? And so it's, it's kind of, it's a very peculiar type of motion that, I mean, I, I talked to physicists uh, and, uh, and they say that, that states like that, they're called often chimera states, so I don't know. If, so so, so if, if the, the right, the left, versus left, the, the, the direction was just the way you set it up somehow. Yeah, yeah, so exactly, you exactly, you have the opposite. Yeah, yeah, it depends on the initial condition, right? So, so, so here is the X versus time, the space-time plot of the same motion, and you see that, uh, you know, definitely there's a, a small slope here. Okay, so, so this is for the shoulder traveling wave, which is a stable fixed point in that diagram. And here is the, um, here is the motion close to the LPT, and shows basically the very strong energy exchange between the two modes, where energy that's confined uh, flow, uh, to, to one mode gets transferred to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the next mode. I mean, this is the highest mode, lowest mode, so, and then you have the splitting phenomenon, uh, uh, as you can see from here. Um, okay, so so this, this this kind of motion, which is highly non-stationary, by the way, and LPTs are especially valid for highly non-stationary uh, process. Um, let me show here. Now, uh, and then we're interested, okay, so in, 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 this, in this specific simulation, we, we chose the highest mode, N, and the next for highest mode, N minus one. But what about if you choose uh, the N mode? Well, it's if you have a chain of 100 particles, take, what about if you take 100, the 100th mode, can it rationally interact with the 60th mode or the 70th mode, right? Uh, well, this diagram shows that the, uh, yeah, in, in, Definitely, you can have uh, resonance interactions. And what do you mean by resonance interactions? The, on the resonance manifold, you have non-trivial uh, uh, stable, uh, stable solutions, right? And, and LPTs, like the ones I showed you. Uh, the 100th mode, the okay, 100 can interact uh, up to, you know, th this shows the dash line. The, the dash line here shows the domain that the mode can interact with another mode. So, so up to the 40th mode, you know, the 100th mode can interact with the 40th mode, but not below. And then, um, so, so uh, uh, this shows that you have very strong, very complicated uh, dynamic inter uh, resonance interactions, one-to-one -one resonance interactions between very uh, widely uh, spaced uh, modes in the linear spectrum, right? But in the nonlinear spectrum, uh, you can achieve this resonance interaction. Uh, just uh, to go back to some, I mean, to, to address some of the issues that were raised before, and, and I fully appreciate uh, the questions asked about the, uh, the different asymptotic limits. All very interesting phenomena happen in the system that only now we try to understand. This, this was not understood yet. So this is a chain of, is, is not, not, this is the full system, right? It's not the sonic vacuum, it's the full system, including both axial and, and without any assumption whatsoever. Except right? for zero pre-stress. Uh, zero pre-stress, absolutely. This is a, a sig one node, right? So we, we take a, a, a hundred particle chain and we apply a vertical uh, impulse at particle field, at the middle of the chain, right? So what happens is that you get an actual wave, right? And you get a transverse wave. The interesting thing is, I mean, this, uh, this, this, this transverse wave gets, uh, you know, there's a front here. We don't understand yet the characteristics of this front. But then when, when this actual wave gets reflected to the boundary, it gets back and basically unloads all its energy to the transverse mode, right? So basically, and you can, change, you can see that it's a change in speed, but, but clearly, if you have pumping of energy, if you want, from the actual direction to the vertical direction. So it's very interesting because um, we've done some work on uh, target energy transfer in vibrations, uh, but this is evidence that, that, that you can you can achieve targeted energy transfer phenomena between waves as well. Okay? Uh, this is space-time uh, representation. So, so this is just uh, an open question and there are other open questions also. 
Um, so, so since I don't have a lot of time, I would like to use the rest of my time to discuss this this, this second system, the second uh, uh, sonic vacuum. And, and uh, basically, we, we got the inspiration for the first system from this one. And this was, um, this was first studied by Vitaly Nestoneko, as I said, from UCSD. And what is this system? It's, it's a set of, uh, it's, it's a very simple system, really. You have a, you have a, uh, you know, a set of spherical elastic bits that interact elastically with each other. Um, again, there's no pre-stress, there's no, no pre-compression, right? The same thing. And the force in, uh, and the interaction, the force interaction law is this, okay? So here I'm plotting the uh, interaction force, and here I'm plotting the relative displacement between beads. Now, when you have compression, you have a held general interaction here, right? So it's three halves. This is, okay, and, and the slope here is zero. So again, you get the sonic vacuum, right? Now, this is, this is hard, but it's not terrible. What is terrible is this. Okay, because this means that in the lack of compression, the system breaks apart. Now, you can try to do analysis, but if the system itself breaks apart, right, what kind of analysis can you do? Yet you can, right? But, but again, the, the, the terrible thing about this system theory, it's a very, very famous system, uh, uh, again, first studied by Mr. Anko, is, is, is this component here, that the system itself, I mean, there are phases in dynamics and acoustics where you have highly compressed motion, in phases where you have discontinuous motion, right? Now, the more compressed the motion becomes, the more linear the motion becomes. So at the limit, when you put very high pre-compression, you can approach the KDD equation, right? So it's, it's a linear equation. So. Okay, so, so by the way, when you study this, I mean, uh, I talked to John Guggenheim earlier today, uh, he asked me about, uh, what about the waves that propagate inside the beads, right? <laughs> so you assume they have a time scale separation, and so that the characteristic time scale of, uh, of wave propagation inside the beads is much, much uh, uh, smaller than, than the characteristic wave propagation of disturbances or channel waves or certain influences in the system. So basically, you can approximate this by, a, by, by coupled, coupled oscillators. Only the coupling force is given by this, right? Given by this. OK, OK. So what, what can we say about this system? So again, the term sonic vacuum was coined by by, by in 2001, and even before when he was uh, when he was in, in, in Russia. So people have been studying this. Oh yeah, much longer than that. Um, before 2001, you mean, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think Nastenko started studying in the, in the in the 60s, in the 50s. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of work in um, in uh, disordered Galois media, right? In Galois flows. But all the ground media is, uh, you know, I think my recollection, uh, Nestorenko was the first to, uh, to produce that. And there are, there are many people working in this area now. Uh, okay, so if you do, so, so again, if you try to do uh, linear, uh, sorry, long wave approximation, again, it's, it's, a, it's a funny proposition to do long wave approximation here because, because actually you cannot do that. If, if, the system, if the system breaks apart, how can you do long wave approximation, right? But, but let's pretend that, that let, 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 let's put aside this, this, uh, this fact. If you go ahead and do long wave approximation, you end up with a PD looking like this, and you can compare it to the classical wave equation. This, this, this plus sign here, this, this, this plus subscript, denotes that this term has meaning only when the bracket, when the uh, term in the parenthesis is greater than zero. So only under compression. And if the term in the parenthesis is less than zero, set this equal to zero, okay? So, so, so again, it's a very difficult system uh, to, to study. Yet, the, you know, the, this is gonna support, can, can support some very interesting dynamics. Uh, just to give you a, um, a, 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 you know, it's a small, a small um, um, indication of uh, the interesting dynamics that Simon has. Suppose that we take a diamond chain, right? So let's assume that we take this chain uh, of beads and uh, we use heavy beads, let's call these heavy beads and, and, and light beads, uh, okay? And uh, the uh, heavy beads, let's say, are normalized with mass one 
and the heavy beams with the light beams by the absolute. Then the equations of motion for this system, the discrete equation of motion, because we don't like to do long wave approximation here, we want to keep the, so we do discrete, the, you know, the discrete uh, uh, model simulations. Uh, can be expressed like this, uh, and there's a single parameter, epsilon. So this, this, this ratio epsilon, which basically uh, is this ratio here, uh, it's both, you know, our rho are the densities and r are the, uh, the radius. Uh, this basically, again, multiplies uh, the motion of the, the high derivative in the motion of the light beams. Uh, okay, okay. Not only that, the only acoustics of this system is fully scalable with energy. That means that you solve the system once and for all, as long as the assumptions are correct, right? Uh, are, are, are valid, right? That means that the, uh, the, the results they're going to show you do not depend on the forcing. Okay, so what can we do here? Again, using this epsilon, uh, again, and taking into account the fact that you can have separation between uh, uh, beats, uh, let's try to do some slow, fast decomposition of dynamics. First of all, some motivation here. So let's assume that epsilon is equal to 0.2. So if you take, if, if you apply an impulse on the left-hand side and look at the, at the pulse of the chip that propagated the system, then you see this, this kind of picture. I mean, this, this is the response of the heavy beam. So you see a pulse, a solitary pulse, that propagates to the medium, right? And then the light beat gets squeezed between the two heavy beats, right? So if the two beats squeeze the light beat, and they start, you know, uh, you have these high frequency oscillations here, and then you have this oscillating tail, right? So, so basically, um, you get different types of response uh, for heavy and light beats in these limits. The heavy beat is kind of slow, slow response. The heavy beat, the, the light beat have a slow response and a superimposed fast response. Okay. So this is for epsilon equals 0 0.2. And then the observation which is key to our analysis, because we want to do some analysis here, is that <coughs> when the primary pulse, what do we mean primary pulse? The main front, if you want, uh, arrives at uh, a heavy light beat system, there will be a squeeze mode where basically the beats will be very highly decompressed, very highly compressed, I should say, right? Very highly compressed, and so that's what we call the squeeze mode, okay? And in that case, beats cannot separate, these beats cannot separate. And so you can drop the pluses out of the equations. Only in that phase, right? The leading at the leading front. Okay, so that's the, the, the squeeze mode. And okay. yes, do, do all the beads are the same size, and this is a broadband pulse, right? Uh, it's uh, an impulse excitation, and we have a dimer. Dimer. So, so basically, we have uh, heavy and light beads that alternate. But they're the same size. Uh, they can be of the same size. If they're of the same size then uh, R1 and R2 are equal, and so you have to use different materials. So is your, pop, so is your stiffness a lot different if the, if, as a function of radii? Because you had a two-third slope yeah. initially, and I'm, I was thinking that was due to the contact area. Yes. The squishing. So well, if the radii, then the radius becomes a function. There are certain assumptions okay. about the Hertzian contact law, and provided that these assumptions are, are satisfied, the only thing that changes is the coefficient of the contact law. Okay? But again, when plasticity effects come into picture, when you have friction, then this model doesn't hold. But experiments have shown that it's a very valid model, provided that the assumption is satisfied. Okay? Right, right, you could, I think the simple answer is if you just made them all the same size and had them at two different densities. Yeah. Or, or yeah, you can do that. Or, but again, uh, you cannot, yeah. So, or you can, you can uh, use the same densities but different sizes, right? So, again, the parameter that governs the problem is epsilon. Okay. All right, and then is the second mode, which is the what we call the collision mode. Now, here they might appear smooth. I mean, the small might appear smooth, but but I assure you, there's a lot of collision here. So it's, it's just, this is what happens in the wake of the primary pulse. So as the primary pulse arrives and is strong in squeeze mode, then it leaves behind all kinds of collisions and oscillations. Okay, and this would be uh, would be the uh, oscillating tail. Somewhat 
something interesting happens in this system. Let me show you. So when epsilon is equal to 0.9, so when epsilon is very close to 1, uh, I'm plotting here the velocity uh, versus time uh, for the heavy bits and the light bits. And you see that, OK, you have some tail, but pretty much you preserve the, uh, the oscillation, right? The, the, the main pulse is a low frequency uh, uh, pulse. When you move to 0 0.6, however, there is very strong attenuation of the pulse. And the oscillating tail increases now. So, so there's a mechanism where energy gets drawn out from the leading uh, pulse and it's transferred to the oscillating tail, which is of high frequency, by the way. So it appears that be a, a, a low to high frequency energy transfer. So this is at 0 0.6. And then at 0 0.3, then you lose this effect. And this happens. And again, you have some oscillating tail, but the pulse does not attenuate. So it seems that the mass ratio plays a very important role in the propagation. And we wanted to study this. So again, this is a sonic vacuum, right? Yet, I will show you that you can study this phenomenon using a, a, a linear model, right? A linear model. Uh, it's very surprising, but it is true. And we checked it with numerical simulations. So, so Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, given that the light bits have this uh, parameter epsilon that multiplies uh, the highest derivative, like, like in the uh, previous system, let's introduce some asymptotics here. This will use a fast time scale T0 and a slow time scale <coughs> T1, epsilon to the beta T0, where beta is to be determined. And then we introduce the following asymptotic expansions for the heavy bits and the light bits. Uh, where we have alpha and gamma are determined by the by the asymptotic expansion by matching uh, by matching asymptotic expansions. It turns out that alpha needs to be two, so this will be a squared, right? So the uh, second order approximation of the heavy bits of what epsilon squared, uh, and then beta is minus one. So t one, the uh, slow time scale is equal to the minus half t zero. And gamma is equal to 1. So for the light bits, gamma is equal to 1. So here's the plan. Um, OK. For a light bit, we observe that there are fast oscillations that are superimposed on a slow, kind of solitary wave. So what we do is at order 1, we compute the uh, slow dynamics of the heavy bit. And at order one, I um, mean for small epsilon, we use as order one solution the Nastarenko solitary wave for the homogeneous problem. So at order one, we uh, we uh, disregard the dimer. We assume that everything is, is is homogeneous, right? At order one, where epsilon is equal to zero. Then I was talking to Richard about this. Then Nastarenko solitary wave uh, requires the solution of a of a system of equations like this. Um, no one has, able to, to, has been able to solve this problem yet, but so, so what, what, what did Nestorenko find? That if you have a homogeneous gamma chain, uh, all bits equal, you apply an impulse, then there is a solitary wave. It's not a soliton, it's a solitary wave, uh, like a bell shape, right, that propagates. And Nestorenko was able to approximate it analytically using the long wavelength approximation. But you might ask, how can you use the long wave approximation if you know if you have separation between bits? Well, the answer is that for that, for the Nestorenko solitary wave, there are no separations of bits. Okay? So basically, as the pulse comes, uh, uh, you know, passes through bits, then the bits come back exactly at the same position as, as uh, when, when the wave came, right? So, so okay. So that's our first order approximation for the uh, uh, for the heavy bits, and for the light bits, at this order, the solution is driven. So the slow dynamics of the light bits are driven by the slow dynamics of the heavy bits. Okay. At and so, sorry for doing so, so much mathematics, but I wanted to show you uh, the, the formulation of the problem, which I think is quite interesting. 
I thought that epsilon then, when you, when you go and, f and study the fast dynamics of the light beams, you get a linear problem. Well, it's certainly it's time varying, right? The, the frequency depends on the fast, uh, on the, on the, on the fast time, uh, uh, T0, right? Uh, but but uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a linear problem. Now, why? Why? This is a very strong linear a sonic vacuum, and yet the fast oscillations of the light beams depend on a linear problem. The reason is that in the squeeze mode, you have very high compression. And under high compression, you linearize the acoustics. So just on the front, just on the front, we have a lot of squeezing between the beats. Then the dynamics are linear, the acoustics are linear. And so basically, uh, the, uh, uh, you can govern, you can, you can study, you can study the shape of the uh, fast oscillations by solving this linear problem, where, where, the, uh, where basically the uh, excitation is given in terms of the slow uh, of, the, of the previous approximation, which is uh, which basically sort the wave. Uh, now the, the question is, okay, how then? What? what uh, how, how can you solve this problem? You need uh, some boundary conditions, some initial conditions, something, right? So how do you do that? Um, then this comes from you know from numerical experiments. So if you look at the waveform uh, uh, for this kind of uh, uh, for this kind of response, uh, you, you see that you can realize solitary waves in the diamond as well, not only in the homogeneous chain but in the diamond as well. And so if you see the the waveform of the light of the of the, of the heavy beats and of the light beats, you know. Uh, this form, uh, I mean, th th these waveforms die out, die out. Not only that, but if you decompose the fast oscillation out of the, of the slow oscillation here, this is what you get. <coughs> so this is the uh, displacement, this is the fast oscillation displacement, and this is the fast oscillation velocity, right? And you see that we have an axis of symmetry here. And so uh, you uh, basically, and what you see is that the fast response decays as it goes to plus or minus infinity. Okay, and so, and so, to study this kind of solitary waves, you have to solve the previous linear problem using this type of boundary conditions. You must require that the, the solution dies out at plus or minus infinity. And then also you observe that uh, there's an axis of symmetry here and that displacement passes approximately to zero at, at, at this point here, where, where this time is basically we shift the time uh, for when the arrival of the sort of impulse that comes here. So you impose this condition here and this condition here to create a boundary body problem. It's a linear boundary body problem. And so then you formulate a linear boundary body problem. That was the previous equation. And these are the, uh, the boundary conditions. And you can use uh, uh, WKB approximation and find the solution. And you can compute uh, the values of epsilon for which these sort of waves can exist. Because it's like an eigenvalue. Epsilon plays the role of the eigenvalue here. And if you do that, you get uh, a countable infinity of sort of waves. You can rigorously prove that as epsilon goes to 0, there's a countable infinity of solitary waves in the diamond chain. And this happened, this solitary waves happen at specific values of the mass ratio. Here's the numerical, this is the solution for the mass ratio that we got from the numerical simulation. And this is from the asymptotic prediction. And you see that as epsilon goes to zero, you get better and better agreement, right? Uh, okay, because then you start getting divergence uh, when epsilon is, is empty. So you get a equivalent to formula. Numerically, these solitary waves some of them are shown here. And uh, basically, the, uh, uh, the waveforms of the heavy beats are always like bell shape. And then uh, the, the, the solid waves are distinguished by the number of oscillations uh, right, of the light beats. OK, so these are fully recovered. And so it was surprised that for the diamond chain, it's, a, it's an order system, but it's homogeneous. You can still get, uh, you can still get uh, uh, solitary waves there. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, done? I think I'm done, right? So a couple of minutes just to 
So actually, this is a simulation to show you to show you, you know, this uh, these dimers. And as you as you're watching the simulation, so ba so basically, I'm plotting the velocity. Um, so as you're watching the simulation, so let me say that you can study the reverse phenomenon. Uh, the reverse phenomenon is where you scatter the, I mean, in this case, you have solitary wave transmission in the chain, right? So that means that no energy is lost from the pulse. Now, the reverse phenomenon is when you have maximum energy lost from the pulse. So maximum transfer of energy from the main pulse to the traveling wave, to the traveling tail, right? To the traveling wave of the tail. And this we characterize as resonance. And, and basically, you can formulate another boundary value problem, again, linear, that, you see? There is no, there's no motion left behind. Where you can study, where you can study, uh, uh, you can study basically the boundary value problem, you can study the resonance. And uh, basically, what happens is that in these resonances, as you can actually predict, there's maximum amount of energy taken from the primary uh, pulse and, and basically transmitted to the tail. So you lose. There's a, a very uh, uh, interesting mechanism of energy redistribution within the system from low to high energies. Here is the corresponding simulation for the uh, for the resonance case. So as you so you see, a completely different behavior here. Uh, this is for epsilon 0 0.57, which was close to 0 0.6 that I showed you before. So now you see that as the pulse propagates, it leaves behind a very strong oscillating tail. And so basically, as it moves through the system, uh, the energy gets transferred from the main poles to the oscillating tail. Okay? And so basically, these two mechanisms I just described, we call them uh, anti resonance and resonances. And I think I will end, I will end with. Uh, Can I start? Yes. Maybe you said this already, but when the mass ratio is very big, Yes. This is to be used to the to the single ball. Thing. That's right. And so basically the Strangle solitary wave is one of the member of this countable infinity of solitary waves for epsilon plus one. Now, I, I think for us that not epsilon one, epsilon zero. Epsilon one. No, but the other the epsilon zero, does that also give that? Oh yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So that, that's a very that's a very good point. Uh, epsilon equals zero is a degenerate case and I thought that is a non physical system, right? But it turns out it's not a non-physical system. So uh, I, I talked to material science people, and it seems that if you use porous media, right, that have very small mass, and you still have some, some stiffness, then you can get the other limits, right? Uh, now, so, so, so yes, so yes, you can. This is the limit absolute zero, right? Absolute zero. Let, let, me, let me come back to this question, but let me show you what I'm plotting here. To me, that's, that's, a, that's, that's basically a, a, a very, uh, a, a synopsis of what I said. Uh, what I'm plotting is, so I, I'm, I'm, t I'm taking a system uh, composed of, I think it was uh, 87 bits, and I'm applying an impulse on the left-hand side, and what I do is I, I measure the force transmitted on the right-hand side, right? And I normalize that force with respect to the force that is transmitted in the corresponding homogeneous system, right? So, so when epsilon equals one, this is equal to one, okay? And you see that there's a very big dip, and this is the mass ratio. There's a very big, very, very big dip of the, of the amplitude. So, so basically, you can attenuate up to 75% uh, of the maximum force transmitted at the end without any damping or dissipation just by this distribution of energy from low to high, fre from low to high frequency as discussed before. And all this purely passive. You just use the nonlinear acoustics to do that, right? And so that's, that's the resonance I was talking about. It's the strongest resonance. And the reason we cannot study this very, very, very clearly, unfortunately, is because you have, you have mixed of scales here. So you cannot do the fast, uh, slow decomposition. Right? But, but then, as you approach the solitary wave, which is an anti resonance, the, uh, the force transmitted goes up because you know, the solitary wave facilitates transmission, right? And then you have the second resonance, which is not as strong, it's not a deep, et cetera, et cetera. So accountable infinity of this case. So that, 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 that's a finding that, that, that we try to use for, for shunt isolation, right? And, uh, and, and for vibration isolation. And, uh, so since I'm running out of time, let me just uh, uh, go to uh, 
so I, I took no conclusion, but just collaborators. Just I, I should not miss to thank uh, the collaborators in this uh, in this effort. And this is uh, Leonid Manovich, uh, the Institute of Chemical Physics in, uh, in Moscow, Mike McFarland, uh, very close collaborator. Yuli was a former postdoc of ours, and now is faculty at Technion, and Oleg Gelderman also is faculty at Technion, and uh, uh, J.K. did his PhD, is at the Indian, is faculty at the Indian Institute of Science, and Hassan is at USD, uh, right now doing his postdoc. And also collaborators, uh, J.K. Young at the uh, University of Washington, Paros Kebrekidis, doing some work with him lately, uh, and, and also the material science person, Historic equivalent, who basically I did not show you, but what we end up building is metamaterials, acoustic metamaterials, with they have embedded chains uh, in the square elastic matrix, and we got some some quite interesting results. Which I don't have time to discuss them with you, uh, including energy redirection. So you can in weakly coupled chains you can design the chain so that you can passively redirect uh, shock energy in preferential directions, and then is to be from from China. So I think I will stop here and. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, I would be happy to entertain. Thank you. I have a question about the title, but I get last priority because I have something in the middle. Go for it. So it seems like if you said epsilon equals precisely zero. Yes. Then you have back the single balls, but only with half the compliance. So it seems like you should recover your, your epsilon equals one solution when you have epsilon equals zero. At least you, there should be some, you should have any traveling wave you have with epsilon equals one, you should have again with epsilon equals zero, but with the, you know, uh, half the compliance. So when, when epsilon equals zero, I, I don't think you recover the original system. You recover the balls, but with springs. Right, but the spring is the same spring, only twice the compliance. Um, uh, uh, yes, but uh, yeah, right, right, right. So, you should right. Back, so any traveling wave you had before, and you, have you should have again. Solitary wave, yes, yes. And, and but this doesn't mean that you'll get the same kind of transmission. The same what? The same type of transmission. Why? Right, when you had a traveling wave? Solitary wave. You had the same solitary, you have a, again a solitary wave. Uh huh. It's the same solitary wave again, only it's every other ball. But, but I'm normalizing with respect to the force transmitted in the original system. And so in the original system, we have a different contact law. But it's the same form of law. It's That's right. It's a factor of two. Uh, so you have a scaling. So you should get back the same solution before it's scaled. Yeah, that's right. And that's so right. that left end is really the same as the right end. Not one, however. But it should be the same in some sense. Uh, the, the solitary wave, yes. Yes, we had a solitary wave, perhaps in the same form, but not, but not scaled to one. Scaled below one, perhaps. You saw here. Yeah, but uh, yes. And by the way, you can, you can get materials like this. If you use porous media, there, where we get like, like sponges, right? Where, where you have very low mass and stiffness. So we can discuss this more if you want. If I'm not convincing you. But I mean, another possibility is that that middle mass when its mass goes to zero, it does some big, its motion, its energy doesn't go to zero, and then you wouldn't get that limit, but that doesn't happen. No. In fact, that mass has no mass, that mass has no mass when epsilon goes to zero, <laughs> that's why. So it has no energy. Uh, Just like you said for John Guggenheimer, you throw away the fast modes inside. That's right, that's the right. Fast, that fast mode disappears from the problem. That's right, that's right, that's right. exactly. No other questions? You, so let me, you let me off the hook. So one okay. more. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, we uh, go next door. <laughs>